The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Thank you. It reminds me of the story that I was reading on the uh, the two of them on the way to Emmaus, and at the time when the Lord was walking with them, they didn't realise that it was He. But when they they found out when they were having the meal, and then the Lord vanished. And the two of them said to each other, Did not our hearts burn as we walked with him? And so I would uh, give you that little message to walk with the Lord. And uh, as a reminder, remember that hymn we used to sing uh, some years ago, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. And the glory... I've got a mental blank. If we walk with with the Lord. So thank you for that. Uh, Now, in the meantime, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all. We have um, a few visitors around. Uh, I think there's... uh, Carolyn, is it? Carolyn's over there and... uh, Ayrton? We haven't seen Ayrton for a while, so lovely to see you. There's another young lady over there, uh, which I do not remember her name. And there's um, John, I think, that comes along generally uh, Easter or Christmas. So thank you very much, uh, John. And also, we've got some interstate visitors, uh, part of Graham and Christine's family, the, the, Sydney, uh, the Sydneyites. And then I... Uh, I believe that we have uh, uh, Tibor's uh, brother and daughter with us as well. So, uh, and we've got two more about to come in, so, uh, or a few more. I think, Lovely to uh, to have you uh, with us today. So um, I don't think there's anything else there except that next Wednesday will be our prayer meeting at uh, at one thirty, and you are all uh, invited to it. And also uh, next Sunday, uh, service will be at eleven a.m. and Graham will be continuing a new series. So uh, in the meantime. I'll hand over to uh, Graham. Thank you, Keith. The Lord is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing together a great hymn of St. Columbus, actually, uh, Christ is the World's Redeemer. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing together this great hymn.
shall we join together in prayer. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Our loving God, we thank you that we worship the living God, that you are into life and giving life to all life thou givest. And we thank you this morning especially that the Lord Jesus Christ, the suffering servant who was promised, came not only to die, but to live and to reign forever. And so we ask that as we join our voices in praise, we might have a sense that we are united with those throughout the ages and around the world. In whatever languages Jesus has been exalted, we too might be one with them. And so, Father, accept our praise and unite us with your people everywhere as we praise our risen Lord today. We ask it for his glory. Amen. Christine's going to bring us uh, Young at Heart. Um, it is just lovely to see you all here today and to see lots of visitors, including our own special visitors from Bondi. Um, okay, well, as you know, this is Easter Sunday. Um, on Friday, and I don't think we have any spare copies of the leaflet. Oh, so Graham has two spare copies of Friday's leaflet if you didn't um, get it on Friday. And it featured this painting. Sorry, I'll need to learn to do my own um, projecting of images. So this um, was bought by Glasgow Corporation, which is what they used to call the council. I think it's now called the council. Not only being canny Scots did they buy the painting, but they bought the intellectual property rights to the painting for the princely sum of £8,200. A price considered very high at the time, although it was less than £12,000, which was the catalogue price. Obviously, in the almost 60 years since then, Glasgow museums have got the cost back many, many times over, because, especially because of having the copyright. The purchase was controversial, as many purchases are. I think the most controversial one I remember since I came to Australia was Blue Poles. Um, and a petition arguing against the purchase and saying that the money should have been spent on exhibition space for local artists was presented to the City Council by students at Glasgow School of Art. I realised preparing for today, 1952 was only seven years after the end of World War II. And so I suspect there were people who thought that money should have been spent rebuilding places for people to live. I don't know. The painting first went on display at the city's Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum on the 23rd of June 1952. My sources say it is now worth £60 million. Pounds. I don't know how you work that out when it's never going to be sold. For me, this painting has a very personal significance. In that year, 52, when I was seven, my mother took me, my older sister, who was 10 going on 11, and my younger brother, who was six, to see it. I think mum really wanted to know what the fuss was about. We were not in the habit of going to galleries for all sorts of reasons. I remember standing there in front of this, what seemed a massive piece of work. I couldn't really understand it. I remember holding 
my memory is that I was holding Mum's hand and Peter was on the other side and Anne was doing the big sister thing. That was my first ever visit to a gallery and it is this Kelvin Grove Art Gallery which since then we've visited with all of the children at different stages and some of our grandchildren have visited. For those of you who've been to Glasgow, you know it's just down the hill from the university. Visiting galleries is now one of my favourite activities and I'm hoping to get to our NGV these holidays. Thinking of this childhood memory and of other of other memories associated with Easter, I decided to ask Facebook friends to tell me what their memories of Easter were. A friend from Glasgow, another Glaswegian, she said, when I was little, we would go to Bella Houston Park in Glasgow to roll our painted boiled eggs down the hill. We were told at Sunday school that this symbolised the rolling of the stone from the cave at the resurrection of Jesus. And she also says that her children and their children still follow this tradition, except in Melbourne, not in Bella Houston Park. Graham and I remember um, doing the same thing, but not, at, the, we, not at, at different parks. Glasgow is a small city, but with a lot of parks. And we were told that that was the symbolism. I discovered last week that since 1878, the Easter egg roll has been a point, uh, popular event hosted at the White House. The South Lawn of the White House is filled with exciting games for the whole family. And this the, the picture that's on the screen is in 1982 with Ronald and Nancy Reagan hosting their Easter egg roll. And normally it includes story time games, live entertainment, but guess what? No Easter egg roll this year because America is still in the grip of the pandemic. One Facebook friend who's of Greek Catholic descent, wrote that she had Stations of the Cross on Good Friday, Mass on Easter Sunday, followed by a big family lunch gathering and Easter egg hunt for the children. Now, this friend lives in Sydney, but we know her son and his wife and family well. And every event there, food is important. And it's always food that was grandma's recipe or great grandma's recipe. The traditions are beautiful. Now, the Easter Bunny as a child, I never heard of. But according to some sources, the Easter Bunny first arrived in America in the 1700s with German immigrants who settled in Pennsylvania and transported their tradition of an egg-laying hare called Osterhase or Osterhaus. Eventually, the custom spread across the US and later still to the other parts of the world. I don't know. I'm not going to contradict that. This other tradition I found, which I absolutely loved, in Bermuda, a local school teacher used a kite to demonstrate to his students, or he thought he was demonstrating to his students, Jesus' ascension into heaven. Um, anyway, everyone has their own imagery. Since then, and this is true, Bermudans have flocked to Horseshoe Bay Beach for the annual Good Friday Kite Festival. Okay, that's just some pleasant rambling that I've been doing. But I just think that whatever traditions we carry, good traditions that we carry, helpful, positive traditions, we should all be careful to pass them on to the next generations. There's a beautiful verse in Psalm 102, verse 18. We want generations to come to praise the Lord. So let's help them with that. 
We want them to know that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, and that all these centuries and two millennia more later, his parting promise still stands. I will be with you always to the end of the age. May God bless us all. Thank you, Kristen. Amanda's going to bring us our Bible reading today. Thank you, Amanda. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, Mark chapter 15, verse 42 to chapter 16, verse 8. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. Now we, we're going to have our offering. I just want to say, if you're uh, a visitor here, you should feel no obligation to make a contribution and also if you uh, if you're paying electronically as I know some of our regular members do then please just uh, wave uh, the bag past that's fine we are very happy about that but your free will offering will now be received thank you Lord, everything we have comes from you. As the hymn writer put it, we give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. But we do pray that these gifts might be a token that we ourselves want to serve the risen Lord Jesus by the way we live and in the days ahead. So please accept what we bring, us included, for his sake. Amen.
The hymn is number 110 in the blue book, which you probably don't have, but it will be on the screen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? a bit of a trick ending there. I normally put the uh, hymn writer at the end and apologies about that. I even tricked myself. So for those of you who are, who are visiting I just want to explain that we've, we're coming to the end of five uh, reflections on one short passage of scripture which is 
from the book of Isaiah. Uh, and in, the, in Isaiah we have a series of songs about a servant. Israel had struggled with trying to be God's people and it was difficult, desperately difficult. And eventually the people were taken into captivity. And as Isaiah looks at this in this long poem, there are f- four servant songs. And we've been looking at the fourth servant song. And it's got five stanzas to it, five sort of paragraphs. And that's what we've been looking at. And, and today we're looking at the last three verses of Isaiah 53, his fourth servant song. And chapter 53, we're actually looking at verses 10 through 12. So that's our focus this morning. And this is the last stanza of the song. Now, I began this series thinking that Isaiah had a lot to tell us about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, in the Old Testament, the resurrection is not spelt out. There are big hints of it here and there. Uh, Precious hints, I'd have to say. Even in the oldest, possibly the oldest book in the Old Testament, the book of Job. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the last day. And that though my flesh worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. And the idea that God will call, and you will call for the creature you have made, and I will answer. They're big ideas in places of the Old Testament, but I'm wanting to suggest to you that in these last verses of this song about a servant of the Lord, we have an image that's very precious, and I want to take you there this morning. But there are three things I want to cover. It's not really a kind of Presbyterian service unless you have three points. So the first one is, I want to think about the mind of God. What is God up to in the world today? That's a challenging thing, and I don't, can't give you a comprehensive answer, but I want to tell you uh, very simply that it's pretty good. And then I want to look at saving the lost. And then I want to think about the servant's resurrection joy. So three things to think about, and they're there in the text, a text that you can look at for yourself in Hebrew. If you go to the Israel Museum on Google, and run your cursor of your uh, computer across the text, it will open up to the English translation of that part of the text. And you can see there, uh, written hundreds of years before Jesus ever came, things that are startlingly true in the life of Jesus, and that the first Jewish, uh, the Jewish disciples, the first Christians, the first people to follow Jesus, saw an amazing, startling fulfillment of what Jesus uh, was doing. So, first of all then, the mind of God. Christians believe that Jesus reveals God to human beings. That in Jesus, the Word, the creative Word of God, became flesh, a human being. And as Eugene Peterson says, moved into the neighborhood. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled. He put his tent up where we are. That's what the word is, actually, the word for a tent. He tabernacled among us. And so Jesus himself kept referring back to the scriptures, having to be fulfilled. There was something working out here. And it was shaping his way of thinking about what he should be doing as well. He had this remarkable confidence in the Old Testament. And that's why uh, in our Christian Bibles, we have those Jewish scriptures. They're here. And some Christians forget that. We need to remember that Jesus' Bible is right here. And the New Testament gives us a lens through which he looks back at that Old Testament scriptures. So God had promised from the very beginning that all the families of the earth would be blessed. That was the story from Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 12. Through you I will bless all the families of the earth. So what I'm saying to you here is that the mind of God is about something good for us. Something wonderful. Who would have guessed it? You know, that was the opening start part of, of the, uh, the servant's song. You know, who, would, who would have guessed this? People are going to be amazed. Kings are going to be stunned by the news that this, this song brings about a saviour, a servant who suffers for others. Suffers for others. So 
God planned blessing. And uh, the, uh, the Hebrew text of this, this service sermon of this song, the Hebrew text of this song, uh, uses a word for a, a trespass offering. That is, when you cross a boundary you shouldn't have crossed, there was a special offering. Uh, and that's the word that's used here. It's the, the word asham. So here it is, a trespass offering to cover the shortfall in the lives of his children. Because the servant, you see, is anticipating that there will be children, men and women throughout history, who will come and seek their sins forgiven. So although it's God's will that his servant should suffer, it was a shared commitment that the father and the son had to endure a cup of suffering as part of a rescue package, to seek lost and wayward people and rescue them, to bring them back. And we know a lot about rescuing people. We've seen it in the floods on our newspapers. We've seen it in the fires. We see it in the global news pattern. We hear it intensely in individual cases. And we, and we see it globally on big picture, people struggling for the way forward. And so here is the, the promise of a servant who, who will see his descendants. But evil people in the story do their worst to him. He is beaten. He suffers. And his, this is God's purpose unfolding in his life. That God's purpose can embrace suffering. God's purpose can embrace our pain. It's hard. I just maybe should just share that I've got to take the service funeral service of a 40-year-old man on, on Friday. Um, how do you say to a family, to his wife and his children and his sisters, that God's purpose embraces suffering? It's so hard, isn't it? So we tread carefully here. But we believe that underlying the human suffering, God is going to work good. And it's, it's amazing. And, and this is... This is uh, true for all of humanity that God has a good purpose. We, we see relationships all over the place messed up and I, I used to use this simple image when I, when I worked at school. I used to use an up arrow, a couple of arrows at odds with each other and a down arrow. And what does all this mean? Well this is all from Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning of the Bible. They're, they're, as soon as the Bible tells us that people got their relationships messed up, it tells us that uh, God has a plan to change this. Our relationship with God, do you remember? The man and the woman, they hide from God. <coughs> Their relationship with God, the Lord, is broken. Their relationships with one another is broken. They start to blame each other. The man says, it was the woman you gave me. The woman says, well, it was the snake. Actually. Oh, no, the, man said it was, the man said it was the woman. The woman said it was the snake, and so on. And so they're, they're kind of at odds with each other. And then we're told that the earth is going to be bring forth thorns and thistles, and life is going to be hard. And, and, the, and from that time on, the whole Bible is working towards restored relationships. God wants things fixed. And so he picks on Abraham and says, Abraham, through you, through your descendants, through the seed of Abraham, I will bring blessing to the world. So this is God's mind. God is thinking this way to bring good to us. And we've already been through Good Friday. And we've been deeply moved by that. That it could be for us that he gave himself. But just remember how challenged the servant was. He's got to go through Gethsemane. You remember, I, I couldn't help but refer to this as I, I, was, I was thinking about it. Jesus in Gethsemane. He's, he's shaped his whole life by the word of the prophets. And, and he's now... He's now coming to the crunch time. He's, taken the, he's arranged to have a donkey and the donkey's brought and he's entered the city as Zechariah said the Messiah would. The king would come on a donkey. And now he's having uh, this, uh, he's taught that he came to give a, his life as a ransom for many. He's using the vocabulary of Isaiah. And, and now he's in Gethsemane. And he, he prays, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. So he commits himself to it, to the horrors that lie in front of him because he believed that there was something beyond it, that he would go through it and it would be worth it. 
It's one thing, I suppose, in the councils of eternity to uh, plan the redemption of a fallen world, but it's another to come into that world and to see what men and women suffer and to take it on yourself and to go through it, to face all that, the humanity of the Lord Jesus, feeling the burden in Gethsemane. But it was to save the lost. And what an amazing thing this is. He came to bear the punishment. This, this is a thought that's repeated several times in the song. And we can't forget that. That he suffers for others. He doesn't do it for himself. We thought, it, we thought he was uh, under God's curse. But in fact he was bearing the, the punishment of others. It was, for us, it was for us he hung and suffered there. The word we use is vicarious. It was vicarious suffering. If we, if we seek shelter in him, he's already paid the price. And we don't have to. There's a transaction going here, on here. When I was a kid living in Broadmeadows, once or twice a year, I'd get a little message from an aunt in Scotland, and it said this. It didn't actually come from her. It came from her bank. It said, you ha we have received an overseas remittance in your favour. It was really nice to get that, you know. Uh, somebody had put money in my account and they thought about me and, and they loved me. I went back to Scotland when I was 18 and uh, I discovered how much they loved me. They did. And so it was wonderful. Now here's what God has done. He's put something into our account. He said, draw on this. Be sure I love you. I'm concerned for your future. I want the best for you. My love is extended to you in my servant. And so by this transaction, the black sheep in the family can become righteous. He can transform us all. And, 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 and here's where we start to go a little bit further. We know Jesus talked about the lost in ways that are unforgettable. Remember, nobody could forget the stories in Luke 15. Once you've heard them, you'll always remember them. No, I haven't had a blank. I'm just asking you to think about it. The lost sheep. You know, you remember the lost sheep? The 90 and 9 that safely lay. When the shepherd went out looking for the lost sheep. The woman and the lost coin. So uh, she searched her house until she found it. And then she said to her neighbors, come and rejoice with me. And then there's the father who's got a lost son. Hang on, he's got two lost sons. One of his lost sons goes to a far country. The other lost son stays at home and thinks, I'm behaving like a slave here, slaving for my dad. That's the word he used. So the father had lost two sons. Jesus is telling us about seeking the lost. Sometimes the lost don't want to be found. But mercy and forgiveness are freely on offer because he took on his shoulders the sin of the many, he took up the cause, as Eugene Peterson translates it from the Hebrew, he took up the cause of all the black sheep. Mercy and forgiveness are now freely on offer and we're encouraged to come. So Jesus tells us those three amazing stories. God like a shepherd looking for the sheep. God like a housewife sweeping through and finding where her, her, uh, her coin might be. One of the first introductions I had to the idea of Bible translation was about a man who'd been translating the Bible in Borneo to people who didn't have coins and they didn't have brushes to sweep their houses and their houses were on poles and they had slatted floors. And he said, how would you translate this story into the, the culture of this people? And then he told us what they did. They discovered that when a man wanted to take a woman and his wife to be engaged to her, he killed a boar and he took the tusk of the boar and she would wear that as a bracelet, a sign of the man's courage and loyalty to her. And this woman had lost her tusk. And she, it had fallen down, presumably. She searched the rubbish under the house because all the rubbish went through the slatted floor. And she searched diligently until she found it. And then she found the joy and went and told her neighbors, I found it. Is that a translation of the story? You can be the judge. But I think it communicates the idea very well. 
And so it is God searches for the lost. He comes and looks among the dust of our floor where the rubbish is. I used the image on Friday of a rubbish truck collecting the rubbish. More and more in our world we're learning the high cost of rubbish disposal. The Son of God knew about the cost of taking the rubbish from our lives. But there's more than that here, and this is what I wanted to get to today. I wanted to get to the resurrection joy of the servant. In Isaiah's song, you see, we're not left with the servant who suffered and died. There's more. The final stanza returns to the opening theme, the ultimate triumph. Because the... the, uh, the work of the servant, is, we're told here, is uh, my servant will succeed in his task. That's the opening line. My servant will succeed. Many people will be shocked when they saw him. He was so disfigured that he hardly looked human. But now nations will marvel and kings will be speechless with amazement. What's happening here? Well, the final re- stanza returns to this idea of triumph. The servant of the Lord will be rewarded extravagantly and he will receive the highest honor. The old version of the Bible, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning of the series, this is one of the first chapters of the Bible that I learned off by heart when I was a teenager. And so I, I... I just found it so striking that Jesus could be described here hundreds of years before he actually came. And so I learned it off by heart. And the, and the phrase that I picked up was, he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. So, so here is the suffering servant and he's seeing what it's going to do and he's satisfied. Now this, it's, it's sort of taking us beyond the grave really. But I was, at a, I was a theological student in 1970, and that was the year I bought my copy of the New English Bible. The Dead Sea Scrolls had been made available to scholars, and scholars were studying that, those, that book in the, uh, in the Israel Museum, uh, where it is now, and they had discovered there was a variation in the text. Remember, this, this text of Isaiah is a thousand years older than the oldest copy we had. We had a copy from the ninth century, but all of a sudden we've got a copy from 100 BC. And what they discovered was, they said that the text had been amazingly accurately copied by hand across hundreds of years, indeed thousands of years. But there was a variation, and the variation was this. It, uh, and the, the uh, New English Bible translates it. I'll just read it to you. Uh, after all his pains this is verse 11 of chapter 53 after all his pains he shall be bathed in light and scholars today reckon that that translation is most likely the authentic translation that the Messiah the servant who suffered was going to be bathed in light now if you read your Bible carefully you'll discover in Job book with a lot of grief and pain in it and you'll discover in the Psalms where there are raw and harsh, harsh, hard felt cries to God, you'll discover that there is a lot of pain but there is also the promise that God's light will bring life to people and so what we're seeing I suggest to you in this servant's resurrection joy at the end is that he will be bathed in light this is the preferred text and uh, Although I didn't like it back in 1970, uh, there were. I say the scholars of the NEB weren't so kind to the prophecy of Zechariah, but but in the Isaiah text, uh, they were spot on. It just so happened that shortly after 1970, a French scholar uh, came up with a new understanding of the Book of Zechariah, and unfortunately, the scholars who produced this version of the Bible had chopped Zechariah around a bit and so uh, they spoiled the structure of the book but uh, here here, this is uh, an insight that the Dead Sea Scrolls contain in Isaiah that help us understand that the servant is going to come right through the suffering and he's going to be bathed in light he's going to be uh, changed bring change 
a, a stunning and amazing change that will shock everyone. We heard Amanda read to us the, probably the oldest account of the resurrection. It, began, it was just there with the empty tomb. There were no appearances in the passage in Mark's Gospel. But here's the thing. Mark's Gospel begins by saying, this is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How did it end? You heard Amanda at the end of Mark's Gospel that the women were trembling and afraid and terrified they ran from the tomb because fear had taken hold of them. What is going on? Now that appears to be the last verse of the, of the gospel. And I think what Mark is telling us is that if you take on board what God is doing in our world, you won't be able to pigeonhole it. You can't just say, oh yes, you know. <laughs> when I worked in a school, there would be 100 or so pigeonholes for the staff, and every day somebody would be putting stuff in your pigeonhole. That's for this, that's for that. No. And we've got everything sorted. But when it comes to God, you can't just say, oh yeah, resurrection, no. You can't just sort it like that. It's deeply human. And it's got all the complexities that you and I have in our human nature. And so when these women ran to that tomb, they were awed by it, the empty tomb. Who had the body? Where had it gone? When we think about this, we've got a few sort of clues about how history is a way... History is a... Uh, Dr. John, Di John Dickinson says uh, that history put, Christianity puts its head on the chopping block of history. There are things that are a consequence of something happening in history. And one is the empty tomb. Where, why didn't somebody produce the body? Especially the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the Herodians who were all down on Jesus, these powerful groups in the community. Why didn't they produce the body? They didn't have it. The best they could come up with was, if you read Matthew's Gospel, to bribe the soldiers to say that the disciples stole the body. Or what about this? Jesus appeared to the women. Now, women had no status. They weren't able to be witnesses in a court of law in those days. The world has changed since then, and perhaps one might even say partly because of them. Uh, Jesus appeared to the women and then to the male disciples later. In fact, the women were told, it was Mary Magdalene in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, and in John, were told that the first witness of the risen Lord was Mary Magdalene. And Jesus said to her, go and tell my disciples. I will go ahead of them to Galilee. So here is the message entrusted to women. And the disciples, they're cowering, they're afraid because... You knew, we know that Peter was scared about what might happen. And it was a horrible thing that could happen. And so they were frightened. But, but once they encountered Christ, and Keith mentioned at the beginning the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I always like to think of it as Cleopas and his wife, but we're never told who the second person was. So they're on the way to Emmaus, and Jesus comes alongside, and they walk with him. And they recognize him in the breaking of bread. And these disciples change from cowering and afraid to death defying. And they begin to meet regularly on the first day of the week, before dawn. If you read the, the letters of the younger Pliny, uh, written around the year 110, when the Roman Empire was down on the Christians, and they were catching them, and if they, were, uh, if they persisted in, they, it was a capital offense to persist in being a Christian at that time. And so Pliny writes about this and he tells us they found out that they meet early on the first day of the week and they sing hymns to somebody called Christus and they pledge to be honest and loyal. And <laughs> but what should we do with them, he says to Trajan the emperor. So the Lord is risen and against all the odds the Christian church came into existence with its life-affirming proclamation that the Lord is risen. That's our prayer today. And let me just take you one step further because I think Isaiah 53 invites this. It says in verse 10, He will see his descendants. He will see them. What does that mean? Well, if you go to the writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament, 
And perhaps that's where you find the best Jewish understanding of Jesus. In the writer of the Hebrews, chapter 2, this is what it says. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am. This is Jesus, the servant, talking to the father. Here I am. And the children you have given me. What an amazing insight into a moment that's beyond our understanding. And we can only just feel how awesome that is. Christ bringing people into the presence of the unseen God and into the glory of a whole new world that's opening up because of the resurrection. May this Easter bring blessing to you and to all those you love. Let us uh, join together in prayer. I've scripted a prayer and I invite you to tune in and to make prayers of your own as we go. Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, who is a God like you, who pardons and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in you this morning as we remember the message given to the women at the tomb of the Lord Jesus. He is not here. He has been raised. We are awed that out of earth's darkest hour, you brought redemption to your people and a message of hope to the earth and salvation to the hearts and homes of women and men, girls and boys. Help us each day as we follow Jesus to be guided by his word and to keep in step with his spirit. Help us to make daily choices that show we are living as disciples of the Lord of life. Help us among our family members and in our homes, with loved ones who know us best, to live in ways that honor you. In a world of many sorrows, heartache and pain, help us to bear one another's burdens as you have borne our sorrows and griefs so that we may rejoice together. We know that responses to the good news of the risen Lord range widely. We see fear of gullibility, deep skepticism and even ridicule. Please help us as we share our faith and hope to do so in ways that erode doubt and encourage faith. Help us as your church to participate wholeheartedly in the commission you have given to take the message to all people Help us in humility and love to serve our neighbours as ourselves. We remember that we are in a pandemic. Help our leaders as they grapple with new kinds of problems to secure the general health of the entire community and protect us from COVID that is still raging in many places. We ask for help for people least able to afford vaccines, thinking especially of Papua New Guinea and our other Pacific neighbours. There are wars and rumours of wars, and we pray for all who are caught up in the violence and hostility of human strife, especially non-combatants and defenceless civilians. O oh, Prince of Peace, we yearn for your peace in the hearts of people everywhere. In Australia, we ask that the social conversations about respectful relationships will be informed more and more by the ethics of the Lord Jesus. Give safety on the roads this Easter break. Be close to those who mourn. Help people who struggle daily with insecurity of income and disrupted family relationships. We think of them and name, you, name them in the quiet of our hearts now. So, Lord, we lift our heart's desires to you. 
and our loved ones in many places. With them we pray in the words the Lord Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 413, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. I'm hoping that you'll be able to linger and gather a chocolate egg and talk to a friend or two at the end of the service. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that your grace, your mercy and your peace would rest upon us now and always.